So, it's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker of the day, Peter van Inwagen, uh, who is professor at Notre Dame University, and as you all know, um, he's a leading contributor in several fields, in, including metaphysics, philosophy of religion, philosophy of action, in particular free will. And the topic of his talk today is going to be two problems for a truth center ontology. Is it on now? Yeah, there we go. Um, so, a more appropriate title uh, for this paper uh, would have been, or rather, a more informative title, if rather unwieldy one, would have been Two Problems for a Truth and Falsity Centered Ontology of Abstract Objects, Sets, and Asymmetrical Relations. So, I'm going to begin by explaining what I mean. Uh, by a truth and falsity centered of ont ontology of abstract objects, here in after a truth centered ontology. And I will then give an outline of one truth centered ontology and say something about why I find this ontology attractive. And finally, I'll discuss two problems that face truth centered ontologies. Namely, first, they are incompatible with the existence of sets. And secondly, it's doubtful whether they are compatible with the existence of uh, asymmetrical relations. Okay, well, it would seem that we all believe that there are things that people say. Consider, for example, these sentences, each of which is certainly a sentence that might be used to say something. And these are at the top of the first page of the handout. We have Paris is the capital of France. The capital city of France is Paris. Paris is the French capital. Paris est la capitale de la France. Paris ist die Hauptstadt von Frankreich. If someone who understands any of these sentences speaks or utter that sentence in, well, let's say, assertion-friendly circumstances, uh, so the speaker is addressing someone the speaker believes understands uh, the sentence, the speaker is not an actor speaking a line in a play, the speaker isn't reading sentences from a card presented by a physician who's uh, testing the speaker to see if he or she is concussed, then the speaker says something, that is, asserts something. And if Alice has said something by uttering one of these sentences, and Bertram has said something by uttering another of them, then Alice and Bertram have said the same thing in different words. Now, if there are things that people say, there are things that people might have said, but never have said, and never will say. It is, for example, extremely unlikely that anyone ever has said, or ever will say, that every building in Seville is a veterinary hospital. Um, but that is something it's possible to say. Um, there are, therefore, things that have not been said, but could be said. Unsaid things that it would be possible to say. And there are vastly many of them. Uh, as many, so many that only an infinitesimal proportion of them ever actually will be said. Now, I'll call things that it's possible to say propositions, but if you don't want to use that word for them, feel free to call them something else. Call them by some other name. I'm with Juliet. What's in her name? Now, one important property of propositions is that they are either true or false, or perhaps of indeterminate truth value. The concept of a proposition, as we might say, involves the concepts of truth uh, or falsity. It involves them in this sense that a person cannot grasp or understand the concept proposition unless that person also grasps the concepts truth and falsity. The concept of a proposition is therefore a truth-involving concept. And we may say that propositions are truth-involving objects and that the kind proposition is a truth-involving kind. In fact, having introduced propositions as things that someone could say, I will confess that this was a bit of a cheat, an expositional trick to aid in explaining what I mean by proposition. Uh, for what I really mean by proposition is something that's either true or false. And it seems plausible to suppose that there are both truths and falsehoods that cannot be said, that is asserted. There is, for example, each, for each real number of the proposition that it is greater than two, and almost none of those propositions can be said, not at any rate by any being whose existence is uncontroversial. 
having noted this, I'll for the most part stick with my expositional trick and what follows. So by a truth-centered ontology, I mean uh, an ontology um, uh, of abstract objects according to which abstract objects are, like propositions, truth-involving. Um, but if proposition is a truth-involving concept, it is not the only one. And propositions are not the only truth-involving objects. For example, for, for in addition to things that can be said, there are things that can be said of things, and there are, these things are true or false of things. For example, that it is a national capital, that it is cubical, that it has proper parts. If Janet says Paris is a national capital, and Etienne uh, says Washington est une capitale nationale, then it would seem the two speakers have both said something and both said something of something. And although what one said was not what the other said, what one said of something is what the other said of something. Different somethings to be sure. Janet said it of Paris and Etienne said it of Washington. That is to say that it is a national capital is something that can be said of things. And the concept of a thing that can be said of things is a truth-involving concept. For a thing that can be said of things can be said truly of things, or it can be said falsely of things. Now, if you don't like calling things that can be said of things um, properties, which is what I call them, feel free to substitute thing that can be said of things, or any other word or phrase you like for property, at any occurrence in the sequel. Again, I'm with Julia. I say that a thing has the pro thing X has the property Y, or that it X instantiates Y, or that X exemplifies Y, or that Y belongs to X, or that Y is a property of X, just in the case that X is true of Y. Thus, in my usage, that it is white, and whiteness are two names for the same object, and the Taj, Mah Taj Mahal has, or instantiates, or exemplifies whiteness, just in the case that that it is white is true of, is something that can be said truly of the Taj Mahal. If there are things that can be said of things, there are things that can be said of plurality of th pluralities of things. For example, that they are philosophers can be said of Locke, Berkeley, and Hume. Um, but please don't suppose that when I say that there are things that can be said of pluralities of things, I mean to uh, affirm the existence of objects called pluralities. The phrases Locke, Berkeley, and Hume, and the British empiricists are not singular terms that denote an object of the type plurality. They're rather plural terms that denote three objects of the type human being. Um, things that can be said of pluralities of things I call relations. And please understand that when I say that relations are said things that can be said of pluralities of things, I mean that there are things that they are things that can be said of pluralities of things, so to speak, collectively. There's a certain perfectly good sense in which that it is a philosopher can be said of Locke and Berkeley and Hume. Here I'll do it. Locke is a philosopher and Berkeley is a philosopher and Hume is a philosopher. But in making that statement, I've said something that it is a philosopher of, Locke, of each of Locke and Berkeley and Hume individually, not of them all collectively. Thus, the sense in which that they are philosophers can be said of Locke and Berkeley and Hume is different from the sense in which that it is a philosopher can be said of Locke and Berkeley and Hume. Now, my example of a relation that they are philosophers is a relation of variable polyadicity. That is, it can be said truly or falsely of any number of things. One can say of Socrates and Plato that they are philosophers, and one can say of the members of the Notre Dame philosophy department that they are philosophers. Relations of variable polyadicity provide the simplest example of relations, but the relations I shall be concerned with are relations of fixed polyadicity, dyadic relations, triadic relations, quadratic relations, and so on. More on these in a moment. Okay, I'm now in a position to provide a statement of my truth-centered ontology of abstract objects. I will call it lightweight Platonism. And there's a brief summary on the handout of what I'm about to say at greater length. The following three theses. 
there uh, constitute what might be called the core of lightweight Platonism. And these three theses are, there are properties, propositions, and relations. Proposition, property, and relation are truth involving kinds. Every abstract object is of one of these three truth involving kinds. I'm fond, I'm fond of the device of bringing the three kinds or categories, proposition, property, and relation together under the umbrella term relation. Propositions are zero term relations, properties are one term or monadic or singulary relations. If we suppose that we know what it is for a sentence to express a relation, we may say that the polyadicity or number of terms of a relation, that is a relation of fixed polyadicity, is equal to the number of variables free in the sentences that express it. So there are zero, there are zero vari variables free in Paris as the capital of France, and it therefore expresses a zero term relation, a proposition. One variable is free in Y is the capital of France, and it therefore expresses a monadic relation, a property. Two variables are free in X is now the capital of Z, but X is not always the, the capital of Z. And it therefore expresses a dyadic relation, and so on. The core of my truth-centered ontology of abstract objects could therefore be stated compactly in these words. There are abstract objects, and something is an abstract object if and only if it is a relation. Lightweight Platonism combines, comprises these core theses and in addition the following theses. First, relations are abundant as opposed to sparse. There is, for example, such a property as being either a perfect number greater than six or the second cousin of the 20th century king of France. No relation is an individual thing, and therefore no property is an individual thing. That is to say, there are no tropes or accidents or modes or property instances. Relations are without causal powers or dispositions. They can be neither agents nor patients. Relations are necessarily existent. Spatial and temporal concepts do not apply to relations. Monadic relations or properties are in no sense constituents of the concrete objects that have or instantiate them. Relations do not in inhere in concrete objects, whatever that might mean. Concrete objects, of course, have properties and stand in relations, but properties and relations are in no sense any part of the being of any of the concrete objects to which they bear the relations having and standing in. Finally, if this is separate from relations do not adhere in concrete objects, relations are not ontologically grounded in concrete objects. But I have no sense of what is meant by either X adheres in Y or X is ontologically grounded in Y. Here endeth the brief exposition of lightweight Platonism. Now, the two problems. And the first is the problem of sets, which, whatever they are, are certainly not properties, much less propositions or relations of any other sort, or relations of any other sort. Truth-centered ontologies, like lightweight Platonism, must find a replacement or substitute for set theory, and pretty obviously this replacement theory will have somehow to use properties to do the work that is normally assigned to sets. But how will it do this? A nominal variable version of Russell's no class theory is one possible answer to this question. Uh, but I want to hint at another answer. And hint is all I can do within the scope of this talk. I'm going to suggest a theory that replaces sets one-on-one -on -one with properties and replaces membership with having or instantiating. And I'm going to hint at a theory that, so to speak, replaces each set with the disjunction of the hexiades of its members. Now, the hexiade of an object is simply the property of being identical with that object. And you'll find that on the handout, followed by some assumptions about hexiades that I'm about to state. For example, consider Boethius Platonity, the property of being Plato. If that property indeed exists, it seems reasonable to assume that it is for a certain object, Plato, of course, the property of being that object. 
According to lightweight Platonism, this property, the hexiety of Plato, can also be called that it is Plato. And what one says of something when one says that it's Plato? I'll assume that everything whatever has a unique hexiety, distinct from it, that no two things have the same, and that no two things have the same hexiety. But an adequate statement of the theory that I'm going to propose as a replacement for set theory requires other assumptions about hexiety, some very powerful ones, but I can't uh, go into them. Um, if properties abound, the hexiades of Socrates and Plato have a disjunction. The property of either being Socrates or Plato. Um, in what follows, I'm going to make use of plural variables. Their range is restricted to hexiades. I'll assume that for any x's and any y's, if x is a disjunction of the y's and y is a disjunction, if x is a disjunction of the x's and y is a disjunction of the y's, then x is identical with y if and only if the x's are identical with the y's. So, uh, same a disjunction of x series, uh, x is the same as a disjunction of x series of y's only. Uh, if the x's are the same as, the, if and only if the x's are the same as the y's. Thus, for any x's, those x's have at most one disjunction. Call it d the x's. Um, so, for any x series, uh, the x's, um, there will be a lots and lots of properties, each of which is such that necessarily a thing has it, if and only if, that, succeedy, uh, that thing succeeding is one of the x's. But at most one of those properties is the disjunction of the x's. Um, but then which pluralities of hexiades do have disjunctions? Which have disjunctions at all? It's not difficult to show that the assumption that every plurality of hexiades has a disjunction leads to a contradiction. That statement, though not the demonstration, is written on the handout. As the primary question for a theory of sets is, which pluralities of objects form or constitute sets, the primary question for the theory I propose to replace set theory with is, which pluralities of hexiades have disjunctions? I'm going to say nothing about that question. I'll simply lay out the ideology of the replacement theory, which I'll call proxy set theory or proxy theory for short. This ideology, will you see, in an obvious sense, mimics the ideology of set theory. Now, most of the following stuff is on the handout. So first of all, we have that x is a proxy, means for some y's, uh, x is the disjunction uh, of the y's, the y's being, of course, x series, or x is the property of being non-self-identical. Uh, that x is a proxy member of y. If x is a proxy and x has or instantiates or uh, whatever you, you, term you like, y. x is the empty proxy if x is the property of being non-self identical. And then we have definitions of, I won't read these remaining definitions. I, I won't read the different, the different, differentia at any rate. Uh, they're obvious, uh, just copies of the corresponding ones from set theory. You can examine them, but there are definitions of subprox, prox union, prox intersection, and then uh, something that mimics the, uh, the curly bracket notation, uh, both by with the list inside the curly brackets and with the variable bonding operator and the condition inside uh, the brackets. Uh, so we could look at some examples of sentences to assert that something is a proxy member of a proxy. See the bottom of the first page of the handout. So assume that the proxy whose members are Socrates and Plato uh, exists. That's a reasonable assumption for proponents of lightweight Platonism, since that proxy is the disjunction of the hexiades of Socrates and Plato. That is, it's the property that either it is Socrates or it is Plato. That is, it's what you say of something when you say that it's either Socrates or Plato. 
So consider the proxy membership sentence Plato belongs to the pro to the Socrates Plato proxy. That sentence is true since that the desire of Socrates or is Plato is true of Plato. Suppose next that the proxet whose only member is the author of the Republic exists. Again, this is a reasonable assumption for lightweight Platonists, owing to the fact that this proxet, if it exists, is the hexity of the author of the Republic. And the hexity of the author of the Republic is that it is Plato. Uh, but wait, is that it is Plato a disjunction of hexities? Well, let's say that every property is a disjunction of properties, since every property is its disjunction with itself. Uh, Consider then the sentence, the most famous pupil of Socrates, proxy belongs to the proxet whose member is the author, of, uh, the author of the Republic. That sentence is true, owing to the fact that that it is Plato, the hexity of the author of the Republic, is true of the most famous pupil, uh, Socrates. Now, um, consider, here's, a, here's finally an example that involves the variable binding of curly brackets. Um, so, is the sentence, Liz Cambridge is a member of the set of, of the proc set of all X, such that X is a woman more than two meters tall, true? Yes, because Cambridge, she's an Australian professional basketball player who is 203 centimeters tall, has the property that is the disjunction of the hexities of all women who are more than two meters tall. So what I've been able to say about proxic theory is very far uh, from being an argument for the conclusion that it's a viable replacement for set theory. What I hope to have accomplished in these brief remarks is only this, to have presented a case for the conclusion that although truth-centered ontologies are incompatible with the existence of sets, it may be possible to find a replacement for set theory that's compatible with a truth-centered ontology. Um, I'm now going to mention two philosophical consequences of replacing sets with proxies. sets. Consider first the problem of singletons. Consider the formulation of set theory in David Lewis's parts of classes. The one mysterious feature of Lewis's theory of classes, at least as Lewis sees mysteries, is the singleton operator. And the ideology of Ludovician class theory comprises the singleton operator, the, re re the relational term is a part of, and the apparatus of nominal variable quantifier logic. Um, but the intrinsic properties of unit Socrates and the reason Socrates bears the membership relation to the thing that is the unique bearer of those properties, whatever they may be, remain mysterious. If singleton sets are mysterious, and Lewis thinks it's not, he's uncovered the mystery that exists for singletons, not that it's a mystery that just attends his peculiar formulation of set theory. If singleton sets are mysterious, singleton proc sets are not or at least singleton prox that Socrates is no more mysterious than what one says of something when one says of it that it is Socrates, for that is what unit Socrates is. And the fact that this prox set has Socrates as its sole member is no more mysterious than the fact that that it is Socrates is true of and only of Socrates. Consider next the question of the reality of ontological grounding. Here's an influential argument. It's on the handout, top of the second page. The set human Socrates and the human being Socrates exist in exactly the same possible worlds. Yet the existence of human Socrates is grounded in the existence of Socrates and not vice versa. So ontological grounding, the grounding of the existence of one object and the existence of another ontologically more fundamental object is a real feature of the world. This argument is, or so I would have contend, both the only plausible argument for the reality of ontological grounding and a very powerful argument for that conclusion, an argument so powerful as to be unanswerable if there are sets. But suppose I deny the existence of sets, or better, suppose I leave it an open question whether sets exist and say that A, whenever I appeal to sets in my own work, I'm to be understood as covertly appealing to proxets. So I'm speaking with the learned vulgar 
when I appear or to refer to or quantify over sets. And B, I propose to understand everyone else's application of set theory in proxet theoretical terms. So let us ask, is unit proxet Socrates grounded in Socrates or in his existence? It would seem not. For whatever ontological grounding may be, and I have no very firm grasp of the concept, it must surely obey this rule, which is written on the handout. If x is ontologically grounded in y, then necessarily if y does not exist, x does not exist. And the following statement is false, also on the handout. Necessarily, if Socrates does not exist, unit Socrates does not exist. Unit proxet Socrates does not exist. For unit proxet Socrates is a property, and thus, at least according to lightweight Platonism, it exists in every possible uh, world. Um, and Pesi Timotheae, that's Anglo-Latin for if Tim will forgive me, there are possible worlds in which Socrates does not exist. Uh, I can, it is, I concede, a defensible position, and it had better be defensible, for my replacement theory requires it, that if Socrates did not exist, the object that is in fact um, unit proxit Socrates would not be unit proxit Socrates, it would not be a proxit at all. For one might argue, and I would argue, um, that if Socrates does not exist, the property that is in actuality the property of being identical with Socrates would not be the property of being identical with anything, and hence would not be a disjunction of axiades. If Socrates did not exist, the object that is in fact unit proxit Socrates would be, so to speak, only a potential proxit, something that could be a proxit. But if unit Socrates would not be a proxit if Socrates did not exist, it would nevertheless exist. It would be there. And it or its existence is therefore not grounded in Socrates or in his existence. One who took this position could certainly say that the status of proxit, unit proxit Socrates as a proxit was, as a proxit, its status as a proxit was grounded in the existence of Socrates. But to say that would be to affirm a case of factual rather than ontological grounding, like the grounding of metal facts and physical facts. I have no objection to physical grounding, although I suspect that it's nothing other than our old friend, supervenience. Okay, now in my introductory remarks, I said it's doubtful whether a truth-centered ontology is compatible with the existence of asymmetrical relations. I must now explain why I regard this as doubtful. If you want a preliminary gesture in the direction of the explanation, I offer this. It's difficult to represent the idea of order, the idea of a sequence of objects using only the resources available within a truth-centered ontology. Let's consider the example of the relation to the north of, a relation that supposedly holds between Edinburgh and London and between Bilbao and Madrid. Well, suppose that Fiona says Edinburgh is to the north of London, and Luis replies, and Bilbao is to the north of Madrid. It is certainly tempting to suppose that each of these two speakers said something of two cities, and what Fiona said of Edinburgh and London, and what Luis said of Bilbao and Madrid are the very same thing. If we use our informal way of naming properties as a model, we might decide to call these things that it is to the north of it. In favor of this choice of name is the fact that Fiona's and Luis's statements both entail, this is the statement numbered one on the handout, there is an x, there is a y, x is to the north of y. And if we are good Quinians, as we all of course should be, we regard variables as nothing more than all-purpose third-person singular pronouns the multiplicity of variables being simply a device for indicating unambiguously within a given sentence which occurrences of the quantifiers, something and everything, are the grammatical antecedents of which, antecedent, of which occurrences of a third person singular pronoun. But we need not employ a multiplicity of variables for this uh, purpose. We might use simply the one pronoun, it, 
and use, as I like to call them, quiet arcs to indicate for each occurrence of it in a sentence, the occurrence of a quantifier that is its grammatical antecedent. One might, for example, regard one as a typographically convenient abbreviation, if abbreviation is the word I want, of the expression two on the handout. And I won't attempt to read that, you just have to look at it. Uh, the color is semantically, is an accident of the production process and is semantically irrelevant. Um, Fiona's and Luis's statement therefore both imply two. And this suggests that that it is to the north of it is a good name uh, for what both what Fiona said of Edinburgh and London and what Luis said of Bilbao and Madrid. And if that it, it is to the north of it is the name of a relation, it's certainly the name of an asymmetrical relation. But consider poor geographically challenged Lord Copper who has confidently proclaimed London is to the north of Edinburgh. It's obvious that if there is something that Fiona said of Edinburgh and London, there's something that Lord Copper said of Edinburgh and London. And what Fiona said of Edinburgh and London and what Lord Copper said of Edinburgh and London can hardly be the same thing if for no other reason because what she said of them is true of them and what he said of them is false of them. Um, but there is as much reason to give the name that it is to the north of it to what Lord Copper said of them as there is to give that name to what Fiona said of them. Therefore, that it is to the north of it does not succeed in naming what Fiona said of Edinburgh and London and Luis said of Bilbao and Madrid. But then what shall we call it? You will, perhaps, have noticed that I apparently just did call it something. Two things, in fact. What Fiona said of Edinburgh and London and what Luis said of Bilbao and Madrid. But really, I managed to use those two phrases as names only if there is something for them to name. Some one thing, such that Fiona said it of London and Edinburgh and Luis said it of Bilbao and Madrid. And it's hard to see what that one thing would be. For, surely, if there were such a thing, it would be the referent of the following description, which is boldface D on the handout. The X such that for any Y and any Z, one says X of Y and Z if one asserts that Y is to the north of Z. Um, now, it will perhaps be a matter of controversy whether it's possible to assert of one of two objects independently of any of description of either of those objects that it is to the north of the other. But I will assume concessively that it is possible to make such assertions and I will assume that asserting that Edinburgh is to the north of London is for some x and some y a case of asserting that x is to the north of y. Even granting this, however, the description d is either improper or if it does denote something, it denotes a, a symmetrical relation. For consider the condition that some object uh, uniquely satisfies if d is a, definite, is a proper definite description. That is, consider the open sentence that's the result of deleting the words the x such that from d. This is number three on the handout. For any y and any z, one says x of y and z if one asserts that y is to the north of z. Is three uniquely satisfied? If it is uniquely satisfied by some object, then that object considers both, uh, satisfies both the condition four on the handout one says X of Edinburgh and London, if one asserts that Edinburgh is to the north of London, and the condition five on the handout, one says X of London and Edinburgh, if one asserts that London is to the north of Edinburgh. For the plural term maker, and, is order indifferent. Edinburgh and London means exactly the same thing as London and Edinburgh. I'm inclined to think that to say that nothing satisfies both the condition four and the condition five. But if anything does, it will have to be some variant on, this is after five on the handout, what one says of London and Edinburgh, if one says that either Edinburgh is to the north of London or London is to the north of Edinburgh. The description D, therefore, denotes nothing or denotes a symmetrical relation. And so for 
what Fiona said of Edinburgh and London and what Luis said of Bilbao and Madrid, either both to note to no nothing or both to note a symmetrical relation. Now the sentence, Edinburgh is to the north of London, is of course a sentence that figured prominently in Russell's discussion of relations in the problems of philosophy and other early works. Russell maintained that there exists, or at any rate, at any rate subsists, a relation, a single relation, that one asserts to hold between those two cities when one asserts that Edinburgh is, to, is north of London. He solved the problem of finding a name for this relation by the simple expedient of placing the words north of in quotes, in what one might call substantive making quotes. He said, for example, the relation north of uh, does not seem to exist in the same sense in which Edinburgh and London exist. But just this expression that results from taking uh, the words, the relational term north of and putting quotes around it, that can hardly be regarded as a satisfactory name. Um, the problem of finding names for asymmetrical relations seems to me to be a problem that has no obvious solution. Now, I don't deny that we can, to borrow Pryor's word, concoct names for such relations and find a vocabulary in which to frame sentences that assert that a good given object, for want of a better phrase, bears one of the, these relations to another given object. For example, one might write sentences like, that this is on the handout, Edinburgh bears, and then in sharp and pointy brackets, bold face one is to the north of bold face two to London. And what follows, I'm gonna pronounce things like that just one is to the north of two. And Z bears two is to the north of one to Y. And I stipulate truth and satisfaction conditions for such sentences. The truth condition of the former sentence, the closed sentence, is paired with it on the handout. It's true if and only if Edinburgh is to the north of London. And the satisfaction condition of the latter sentence, the open sentence, is paired with it. Z and Y satisfied if and only if Y is to the north of Z. And I hope the, well, let's call it the algorithm that takes us from the first sentence in each pair to the semantically equivalent second sentence, second sentence in each pair is evident. In each, in these sentences, the expressions one is to the north of two and two is to the north of one, and let's call such expressions canonical dyadic relation names, are terms. They occupy positions subject to existential generalization. Each denotes a relation, and the relation that either denotes is the converse of the relation the other uh, denotes. That is, x bears one is to the north of two to y, if and only if y bears two is to the north of one to x. Intuitively speaking, one is to the north of two is what Russell called north of. And two is to the north of one is what? Well, perhaps Russell would have called it south of. The principal difficulties with this proposal, from my point of view at least, are two. First, it doesn't enable me to understand the expressions I've called canonical dyadic relation names. And secondly, it doesn't enable me to understand the open sentence x bears y to z. From my point of view, if one concocts a class of phrases by specifying certain formation rules, specifies the syntactical role of such phrases, and finally provides statements of truth and satisfaction conditions for the syntactically correct sentences that contain them, one has not thereby explained the meanings of the phrases in, um, in that class of in the class of sentence, in that class or of the sentences in which they occur. If that procedure were a way to explain the meanings of such phrases, substitutional quantification would be meaningless, would be meaningful and it is not. Well, when I say things like that, no one believes me. So I'll say no more in that vein. I will, however, raise a different sort of difficulty for the proposal under consideration. It cannot, at least uh, in any way that I can see, be extended to relations of greater polyadicity than two, to triadic, quadratic, etc. Relations, sentences formed by writing a term X, um, or, or our proposal involved what might call canonical dyadic relation sentences. 
sentences formed by writing a term X, then writing bears, then writing a canonical dyadic relation name, then writing two, and then writing a term Y. Such sentences involve terms that perform three grammatical functions in relation to verbs, uh, to the verb to bear. Its subject, uh, X is its subject, the canonical di dyadic relation name is its direct object, and Y is its indirect object. And you'll see on the handout uh, an illustrative example. So Edinburgh bears one is to the north and two to London. You'll see that Edinburgh is the subject of the verb to bear. One is to the north and two is its direct object, and London is its indirect object. Um, all right. Since the initial term of such sentences is the subject of the verb to bear, and its final term is the indirect object of the verb, our use of the verb to bear induced an asymmetry between the two terms. By using canonical dyadic relation sentences, we caused one of the terms of the, um, to name the object that bears the indicated relation to the referent of the indirect object, and the other to name the object that the indicated relation is born to by the referent of that object. But suppose we introduce canonical triadic relation names, like one lies between two and three. Now, if that relation, uh, if that expression it indeed names a relation, this relation is, so to speak, not invariant under permutation of its terms. Since, for example, Madrid lies between Bilbao and Malaga, but Malaga does not lie between Bilbao and Madrid. Let's say that according as a relation is or is not invariant under permutation of its terms, it's permutable or impermutable. The concept of impermutability, of course, applies to dyadic relations if it applies to triadic relations. An impermutable dyadic relation is simply an asymmetrical relation. But having done this much, having introduced canonical names for triadic relations, we have um, uh, gone as far as we can go because we can't introduce triadic, there's no way to introduce triadic relation sentences. There's no way to form a verb, find a verb that finds, will perform the function that bears plays in canonical dyadic relation sentences because that verb would have to take three kinds of object. Direct object, indirect object, and well, some other kind of object. And, there isn't any other kind of object, or at least there isn't in any language I'm familiar with. I guess, for all I know, maybe there's some other kind of verbal object in Basque or Iroquois. But since I don't know about it, I'm going to have to ignore that possibility uh, in the uh, sequel. Um, so maybe one explanation of the fact that we can't find um, any way to express impermutable. I'm just going to re revert to the case of asymmetrical dyadic relations for simplicity. Uh, maybe the explanation of the fact that we can't find satisfactory names for them is that there aren't any such things. This is a position that's been taken by Kean Dorr and by other prominent philosophers. Um, and it's not without its difficulties, of course. Uh, anyone who accepts it is going to have to deal with general statements like, there are relations that all people bear to their mothers, and their mothers in no case bear it to them. That's on the handout because we're going to come back uh, to it. Well, one thing you might do in such a case is replace relations with relations. Uh, say, let's just retreat to relations and extension, and again, we can have, they'd be proxy uh, theory relations in extension. Another thing we might do is to um, say, look, um, there are no asymmetrical relations, but not to worry, there are properties of sequences. Of course, they're proxy. Uh, they're sequences defined by the wiener kuratowski method um, uh, proxets. But, um, so there are properties of sequences like that it's a two-term sequence whose first term is to the north of its second term. Um, so in that case, you would read Edinburgh bears north of to London as the sequence, the two-term sequence, Edinburgh, London, as the property. That it is a two-term sequence whose first term is to the north of its second term. 
Um, and then we could eliminate quantifications over asymmetrical relations, and more generally over impermutable relations in favor of quantification over sequences of certain properties of, uh, over sequences and certain properties of sequences. Uh, sequential descriptors, uh, like for example, that its third term is to the north of its second term, and its first term lies between its second and its third terms. So, so the sentence about mothers uh, could be, for, there are relations that all people bear to their mothers, and their mothers in no case bear to them, could be replaced by, there are dyadic, dyadic sequential descriptors that are true of every ordered pair whose second term is the mother of its first term, and are true of no ordered pair whose first term is the mother of its second term. I hope it won't be necessary to do any of these things. I'm very much taken by the elegance of the idea uh, that say sentences uh, with two variables free of them express uh, dyadic relations, sentences with three variables free of them express triadic relations, and so on. But I confess that I'm unable to develop this elegant idea into a coherent theory that permits the existence of asymmetrical and more generally impermutable relations and I begin to fear that the task is an impossible one. Thank you.